Hi everyone, my name is Lori Conlon and I work in the Office of Intramural Training and Education at the NIH. And I'm so excited you could join us today for our panel for the NIH Career Symposium on Government Careers. So I have uh, four panelists here with me today that I'm really excited, I know all of them. They were postdocs at the NIH with us. And so it's Lieutenant Commander Oliver Wu, it's Rebecca Messerol, uh, Brian Janelis, and Delaney Torres. So we are going to have them each introduce where they work, what they do, and all the wonderful things that is. So um, Oliver, I'm gonna hand it off to you first. Thank you very much, Laurie. It's good to uh, talk about uh, my experience, share my experience. So I'm right now a consumer safety officer with FDA CIFSAN, that is Center for Food and Applied Nutrition. I serve as a coordinator for CIFSAN's adverse event report system. Uh, before that, I was with USDA for seven years after my postdoc experience at NIH. Then I joined USD for seven years. I was a regulatory scientist reviewing laboratory methods, conducting auditing of laboratories, reviewing World Trade Organization, WTO notifications to support global trade. And then I also served on the recall committee to provide a public health risk assessment and the recall classification. That's really cool. That's really cool. So it's really quite different than what you did as a postdoc, really. It's, you know, looking at the, the food safety chain, really. Right. It's totally different, but it's all based on science. So That's cool. That's cool. All right, Rebecca. Rebecca is at the NIH. Take it away. What's your job? I'm a health science policy analyst in the Office of Portfolio Analysis. So um, that's in the Office of the Director at NIH. Um, and I do a lot of different things as part of my role as health science policy analyst. I mainly conduct and coordinate analyses to inform data-driven decision-making at the NIH. So that's how we serve the NIH mission. Um, we actually have a very active research and development component of the office. So I'm still actively involved in research. It's just research on the NIH portfolio instead of my old cell biology science. Right, all those analy analyzing data skills co still come into play, right? Absolutely, all the time. And I'm still, we still are actively publishing. We had three papers out last wow. October. Um, and we'll have another couple probably being written up this year. And I put together a lot of PowerPoints. So, you know, we're still doing presentations and publications just as you would in the lab. Oh, that's really cool. Brian, it sounds like you're at the FDA too, but your job sounds really different than Oliver's job. What do you do at the FDA? That, that's correct. Thanks, Laurie, for having me here. Appreciate it. Um, so I am a product quality team lead within the Office of Biotechnology Products, which is an office within FDA uh, Cedar. So what does that really mean? So OBP, Office of Biotechnology Products, is really focused on the quality review of monoclonal antibodies and most therapeutic proteins at Cedar. So our focus is really to ensure that biotechnology products that are administered to people are safe and of acceptable quality. So as a team leader, my main duties include training, overseeing, and review of regulatory submissions of a team of roughly three primary reviewers. Now, just to highlight some of the main duties for the primary reviewers, just because this is typically the most entry type of uh, position within OBP, uh, is really to do the initial product quality assessment of investigational new drug applications, biologic licensed applications. Now, primary reviewers can also participate in domestic and foreign inspections of manufacturing facilities, and they can interact with sponsors and applicants in various formats. Now, some of the reviewers at OBP are, can, can also probably be researchers, but can have a role in doing the, the review work as well. So that's basically, you know, what I do and so did, what I have done as a primary reviewer. Yeah, I was say, you started as a primary reviewer and moved up? Yes, yes. Essentially, I joined uh, December 2014. I was a primary reviewer for roughly three years, and I've been serving as, as this team lead capacity for roughly two years now. Oh, that's really cool. Now, Delaney, I think you are the one who has uh, transitioned to federal service most recently. So tell us, what do you do? Yes. I mean, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Laurie, and, and the whole uh, organizing team to, uh, for the invitation. I mean, it's really, I mean, I was, I was, as you just mentioned, I was like on the other side of the room or on the other side of the camera about a year ago. So uh, I was actually uh, in the committee uh, when I left. So 
I'm pretty sure you remember because I left everyone kind of hanging there. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so basically, uh, so I was a, a research fellow at uh, NIMH, Mental Health, for about six years. Uh, and so I'm a biophysicist, uh, neuroscientist. Uh, I, I mainly study uh, ion channels in the brain, or I used to study <laughs> ion channels in the brain. And I, I joined uh, NINDS as a scientific review officer uh, about a year ago. Uh, basically, my job is uh, we do, uh, uh, in simple words, is run review and administration. Uh, so my, our main mission is to make sure that the peer review process, uh, peer review process is, is efficient and, and fair. Uh, so basically, we, we run a, a monetary review of, of all the applications that, that come to our hands. Uh, we recruit uh, the uh, appropriate experts to review those grants that, that we have in our session. And then we run the review panel. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, we uh, uh, also send feedback to to the applicants uh, in a, the, what is called a summer statement to basically summarize everything that was discussed during the panel uh, concerning the, the applicant, uh, the, the application. So that's okay. pretty much what I do. That's really cool. So it's similar to FDA in that you're both reviewing, but you're gathering large panels of experts versus the FDA reviewers are doing the review by themselves. Yeah. Well, within a team, right? <laughs> um, actually, Brian, I want to ask you about that. Tell me about what the, who's on your team. Is it just a bunch of um, biochemists, so to speak? Or who are the different players who help review an, uh, an IND at the FDA? So there's different perspectives. So from our perspective, we are the product quality. So and typically, you know, people who work on the product quality team have a background in biology and chemistry. But we also interact with other disciplines, such as uh, medical officers, you know, from a clinical team. There's uh, a non-clinical team, a farm talk. So there's different teams that come together to determine whether a submission can be safe to proceed for an IND and, and also when the sponsors submit the licensing application. So there's a lot of teamwork involved here from different perspectives. Yeah, I think that's going to be a theme as we kind of go around our circle hill. Oliver, you, you spend a lot of time as a consumer safety officer doing, going out in the field, right? And doing, do you, are you, well, not yet, right now we're all staying at home, right? But, you know, <laughs> is that the, the goal is you'll be going um, out in the field and then who else is on your team? So right now the person I'm in as the coordinator. So my laboratory experience will really help a lot because a lot of campaigns involved that we have to test the products. So I work with chemists, microbiologists in the lab, they do the testing. And then I work with medical officers, they review the results, making recommendations, how we deal with the product. Yeah, so, so it's a lot of people. Right, yeah, it's teamwork. It's all about mm -hmm. teamwork. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, how about you in your office of uh, portfolio analysis? Is it a team or more independent? It's a team. We actually have sort of three or four teams that interact with each other. So we have the analysts, most of whom come from a scientific background, so mostly have PhD. And, um, and many, actually, many have come from building eight <laughs> at NIH. Um, so either some biomedical background, or we have a, a couple of economists that fall into that category. Um, we also have a group of data scientists, so they sort of bridge between the analysts and uh, our developers who work on our, our tools that are a really important part of our, um, our office. So we have all these uh, suites of analytical tools that people can use. Um, and those were developed for the analysts, so to speak, by the developers. And then we also have a training team who who branch all, th all three of those other groups mm -hmm. and um, go out into the NIH and teach uh, how to use our tools. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, Delaney, I know grants, the grant side of the house has a lot of teamwork. Who's on your team? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, so once, once we get actually the, 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 the package of obligations in our hands, we kind of more like uh, uh, independent. Uh, so we, we typically run the meetings uh, by ourselves. But in our branch, actually, we, we try to uh, work as a team as much as, as, as possible. And actually, so it's more like, I mean, at, so, so at the time of deciding, for example, uh, what kind of uh, 
application we, uh, each of us is kind of handle, yeah. we do it as a team, right? Uh, and then also, uh, for example, uh, especially in these current situations, so we typically have like a backup SRO mm -hmm. in, in case that something goes wrong. Like for example, now that we have to run these big Zoom meetings, typically one SRO run the meeting and the other one run the Zoom meeting. Like, because we have to deal uh, with like conflicts yeah. and stuff. So we have to move people out of the virtual room and put them back when, when appropriate. So that's very tough when you have like a 40, 50. Yeah, bucks, right. Uh, now, what, a, what about a program officer? What is a, what's the difference between you and a program officer? That's actually a very good question because I mean, people that are interested in this job always have this question. So the main difference is that, so our job is, is I, would, I always describe it as divided in two phases, right? So, uh, so and I think the program officer goes like before and after us. So the program officer is kind of like, it has like a very uh, uh, strong uh, role in recruiting the applicants, right? Mm -hmm. Although we kind of participate in that too, but that's kind of the, the program officer's uh, job. And they, they speak with the applicants on the phone, I try to determine where the, which is the best interviews that they should go for and, and so forth and so, so on and so forth. And then, uh, so we do the whole the whole uh, review process. Is that after we're done, then the program offices deal with the applicants in terms of if they get funded, so they yeah. deal with, with, the, with the money and, and all that throughout the, the length of, of the grant. Or if they don't get funded, Typically, the program officer uh, interact with the applicant, say, "This is what this is what uh, the reviewers didn't like. This is what you can yeah. improve to come back next year." So that's that's mainly the difference. So the, the program officer uh, interact more with the applicant uh, uh, post award and, and post uh, review. So that's that's really cool. So now all of you chose to do federal service, and I'm interested in why you guys chose the. Um, chose the agency that you went to. Did you look at any other agencies? And um, specifically for Oliver, why are, did you choose to do the uniformed um, service, the public health service? So we'll start with Oliver and then we'll kind of move around. So Oliver, tell us a little bit about the um, public health service, why you chose it, and then why you've chosen USDA and now FDA. Sure, thank you, Rory. So I choose public health service because when I was at NIH as a postdoc, I saw some officers there and they are in uniforms. I was wondering what they are doing at NIH campus. <laughs> so that sparked my interest. And through some informa informational interviews and uh, symposium, uh, career symposiums, I learned more about the mission. So it aligns with my interest, that is to uh, protect, promote public health and advance public health, safety of our nation. So I was very interested in that. So I applied in 2012. I was there until 2013. After you apply to the Commission Corps, they do have some opportunities out there for you as officers, uh, officer candidate. So uh, at that time, I have offers from USDA, EPA, um, and, uh, and also they encourage us to move around. So that's why I'm right now in FDA. Since once you're in the Commission Corps, you have a lot of opportunities to know different uh, uh, things and uh, move around in different agencies. Yeah, it's funny. I have a really good friend who is um, uh, in the Navy. He joined the Navy after we were postdocs. And I call him the permanent postdoc because every three to six years, he gets a new job. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And in some ways, it's kind of fun, right? Because you get to try some new things and you don't get stuck kind of where you're at. All right, All right. Rebecca, why did you choose the NIH? Why did you choose it to stay? Well, um, I wasn't totally actively looking for jobs at the time that I found this job. Um, one of the former postdocs in the lab I was working in at the time was part of the Office of Portfolio Analysis, and she said she was looking for writers, um, possibly to do a detail. So my PI suggested that I talk to her, and it turns out there was actually a job. But I was very happy to stay at the NIH because it's great to be able to still be a part of the NIH community and be supporting biomedical research um, through the analysis. I, I really like being there. That's cool. Brian, why'd you choose the FDA? Sure. So as a graduate student at Pitt and a postdoc at NIH, really like my research was focused on, although it was basic immunological research, the goal is really to develop a 
vaccine therapeutic, you know, product, you know, so you can treat mm-hmm. disease, you know, that was the idea. So I really became interested, you know, and, you know, what is it like at the, you know, the, the light of the end of the tunnel? Mm-hmm. So as resp- respect to, you know, drug development and, you know, what happens to the, re- you know, the research that supports potential drug candidates. So at the NIH, I took a course uh, called FDA's Perspective oh. on Drug Development, and that was um, sponsored by FAES, Foundation of Advanced Education Science. And that really introduced me to exactly you know, the process of drug development, the components of it, um, the different perspectives and how, you know, what is FDA's approach to it? So at that point, I became really interested. And I mean, I always had an interest in drug development and I just, it was essentially my dream job, you know, so as cliche as that sounds, you know, (laughs) and it's really like you spent all this, all these years doing research and you want to see what happens to that research. So so I, for me, it wasn't so much of me finding a government job. It was kind of finding a, a good fit job for my interest in, you know, understand drug development. And I think that course really opened my eyes to understanding the regulatory aspect of it. And, you know, and I, I fully believe in, you know, the mission to protect and promote public health. So I just felt it was a good, good fit for me. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Sounds like that course at FAS was really key to you being successful to be a competitive applicant. Absolutely. How about you, Delaney? Why did you want to stay at the NIH? Yeah, I uh, so I kind of like the, the uh, Brian's uh, uh, statement because I mean I kind of like on that on that uh, front too. I, I actually I wasn't I didn't focus on a specific job or agency on that, and so I I'm, I have to be honest. And my main focus uh, 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 I'm not sure you probably won't remember, but my main focus was stay in the DMV. So that was like that was what I wanted because I have a family. I've been moving through my career for about for 20 years around the world and I was done with it. <laughs> so that was my main focus. But I was looking for something that that I that uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, uh, that uh, something I would believe in and uh, I'll really be enjoy. And so I was looking for different, different uh, things. And, uh, so I have a little story that there, so just to make the the, the point that I, I wouldn't, I mean, my advice don't don't focus on, on a one type of job. Or agency, but be open to whatever you think that you can be uh, happy doing. So my my quick story is that so my so what I wanted to be when I was like a kid was an astrophysicist, and I never got to study that because of whatever reasons. And so the the, the point is that so if you want to be an astrophysicist uh, as your dream job, what is the place you want to look for? NASA, right? <laughs> so. So this is what happened. I mean, after the conversation with Lori, Lori put me in contact with one former NASA employee. And I didn't get a job at NASA, but I got this close. I mean, I got to speak with the head of the space biology program at NASA. So I didn't get the job because there wasn't an, there wasn't an opportunity, but I was very close to, to like <laughs> at least. So with that, what I want to what I want to make clear out there for everybody looking for a job is don't 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 go for one thing, but stay open, yeah. stay uh, flexible, and eventually you'll find, you find uh, what, what you're looking for. So it actually leads us into the next question that I wanted to ask you guys is, you all have friends, you all have, you know, you've been in the system for a while. Where else in the federal government do you see people? So we've had now the USDA, the FDA, the NIH, NASA, um, my friend, I have two friends in the, in the military. So one is in uh, a Navy and one guy went to army and I have one guy who's an FBI agent. So anybody else want to put some things on the table of where you've seen PhDs go in the government? The CDC. CDC. Yes. A lot of people. Uh, yeah. I know there are also program officer jobs at the VA at ARC. So just wait, what's pro- ARC? What's ARC? Oh, oh gosh. AHRQ, what does it stand for? Oh, AHRQ. Um, That's okay. People can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many acronyms in the federal government. That's something right. um, if you're watching this video, you should be aware of, right? <laughs> um, anyway, the so if you just look at the HHS agencies, I think a lot of them will have jobs that would be applicable to many people who are looking. Anybody else? Yeah, as weird as it may sound, CIA. Oh, <laughs> they 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 do have a, 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 a science analysis. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, All right. I mean, Anybody that's, else? That's a kind of 
hard. I can't tell you what they do, but (laughs) (laughs) Um, I also know people at the Department of Defense. So both at the Pentagon and also um, at various other um, components. Um, And uh, what's the other one that I just came into my head? Oh, the State Department. There's a lot of people who go to the State Department and also on con- in Congress, um, so as legislative affairs agents. Yeah. Anybody right. else? And uh, I guess if you have a background in environmental science, EPA it could be a potential uh, option mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, and also I think the technology transfer office, mm-hmm. a lot of people there, the patent. Oh yeah, the patent office. We have a ton of alumni in the patent office. That's a good one. Wow. So, I mean, getting a job in the federal government, it allows you to have a a broad spectrum. But I think one of the biggest questions that people have is, how do you even get a job with the government? So how how did you guys get your job? So Oliver, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think NIH is a great place. I would stay there if I could at that time. (laughs) And I was very active when I was at NIH, just like uh, uh, Brian. I also went to the FAES. Uh, I took the FDA uh, law or regulatory science course there and the uh, statistics. And also I took the patent mm. uh, technology transfer course there too. Uh, I also teach a course there because there was a great deal. If you teach a course, you can take uh, other ca- classes for free. Right. So I went to a building in 60. It was a great time when I was at NIH. And uh, because NIH really opened my eyes to all different opportunities. You know, when I was in graduate school, or we only know the career is doing academic research. But at NIH, we are exposed to so many different opportunities, technology transfer, regular science. And from there, you know, being active, involved with the symposium and planning, I was a com- a part of committee too for a career symposium. I think all of you were. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good opportunity to learn different uh, uh, jobs out of there. And uh, then to supply, you know, they have a, you mentioned maybe best to get your, your foot in the door, like triple AS fellowship. I also applied for FDA, NIH, this uh, joint uh, oncology task force. Mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. uh, accepted to that program, even though I choose the uh, commission core. But there's a lot of opportunities. And also USDA also have the pathway program. They hire a PhD Oh, as well. in pathways. Yeah. And right now, CDC, they also have the program called the laboratory leadership service. They train scientists as the leaders in the laboratory testing, like oh. director level. It's also a very good program. They just started uh, maybe two or three years ago. This is similar to the EIS program, which is epidemiology Intelligent intelligence survey. That's where they do all the uh, investigation. They mm-hmm. send outbreak. Yeah, they're very busy right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca, did you come in um, as a government employee, or did you come in as a contractor and then transition over? That's right. I was Tell a me about that. For, yeah. So when I started off. Um, I was a co- contractor with Lidos um, at, under the umbrella of the Office of Portfolio Analysis. I was contracted to them. And then as time went on, it was clear like this, my, the director of the office wanted me to serve in more of um, an administrative position that really needed to have a Fed. So mm. contractors can't do all the things the Feds can do in terms of I'm doing statements of work for the contractors, um, seeing sensitive data, things of this nature. And so I applied for a a GS-14 position, a health science policy analyst position on USA Jobs. And I was pulled in to a a GS-14 in our office after making cert for that. Nice. Yeah. Brian, did you come in as a GS employee? So through USAjobs.gov or did you come in through another mechanism? No, very unconventional. So my path involved a lot of left turns, right turns, and sometimes (laughs) circles. So when I took that course, uh, you know, I was pretty much finishing my post. I got my paper. I was ready to move forward. And, you know, and I know there's jobs on USA or, you know, um, advertisements on USA Jobs. So I applied to a couple of those with with no luck. So I decided that I was going to kind of go on the FDA website, find the directors or view chiefs of offices that I felt are applicable to my background. So I just sent my resume 
And um, it might not sound like a success story at first because I didn't hear it back until a year later. And at that time, you know, I decided to uh, contract uh, in, in the same lab at the NIH. Um, so I did that and I was ready to accept a, a job in industry, you know, up in Massachusetts, you know, doing immunological uh, research. So at that time, I was about to accept that position. I got an email from a review chief with an OVP saying that, you seem like a good potential candidate. Would you like to come in for an interview? So I'm like, yes, absolutely. So I, I interviewed and, you know, based you know, on my lack of you know, direct experience, I really had to make myself translatable. And, and apparently I did a good job because, you know, I was offered a position. So um, that's, that's my story, really. What was that first position then? Because it wasn't through USA Jobs. So what, what yeah, was the so first position? So I got, I got hired. And this is a cool thing. So you can get hired, at least like with OVP, you can get hired staff fellow. So it's a way, you know, a lot of people have been brought on, you know, in our office, you know, as a staff fellow where you don't actually have to have a cert advertisement for mm -hmm. that position. And you can be a staff fellow until you convert it over into the GS system. Now, there's, there's other pathways that, you know, there's, there's fellowships that, you know, FDA has where you can join. There's the um, there's I think there's a partnership between NCI and FDA yeah. that you know, you know most of our people here, not most but a great majority, have participated in some sort of fellowship or, or not or, or some other pathway. But the staff fellow to an FTE is it's a very normal occurrence over at the FDA. Absolutely. And yeah. I think the key with the staff fellow though is that they're never po they're rarely posted. They're all done through networking, right? Yes, I think you, you need to network and and like for me, so I just circulated my my resume and you know, as you know, for different offices the workload may increase, the capacity for reviewers might increase, so they may have spots open mm -hmm. and, and those spots may have um you know, likely have advertisements, you know, posted as well. So I th I think the, the main goal is to really select the most qualified candidates mm -hmm. and you know, um, USA Jobs might be a more direct, you know, way, but, you know, if you have patience, you can submit your resume um, and, and wait for a position to to come about. And that, that's exactly what, what I what I did inadvertently. So that's cool. That's really yeah. cool. How about you, Delaney? USA Jobs or some other mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I actually love this question. I mean, the, the, the fast answer is in USA Job, but I mean, the fact that I love this question is because, uh, so I think, a lot of stories that come out of these symposiums are people that get jobs through an unconventional way. And so the, 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 the reason I say that is because, so my job is a little bit tricky and this works both for SROs and program director program officers that unfortunately, I, I, do, I, I disagree with that. I'm, I'm, I do my best to change that, that culture. But typically, the people that are hiring our positions are people that are coming from faculty positions, mm -hmm. all right? So it's very uncommon that they will hire someone like us, like like where, like the people that are uh, sitting here uh, listening to us. Uh, and the one thing that I would recommend 100%, uh, there are two things that I recommend. The one thing that I learned in here, it was the detail. So I didn't know what a detail was until I heard in one of the, uh, in the first symposium, career at Ascendant. And the detail basically is like a volunteer work that you do in, in, in some some government uh, uh, agencies. Uh, it works, I'm pretty sure that it works for every agency. And so basically you have to agree with your mentor at NIH that will allow you to do that. Uh, but that's the best way to get the job that I'm, I, uh, am I uh, like bypassing the faculty position. And the other advice I have for that is networking, networking, networking. <laughs> right. I mean, I, 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 I have to admit that six years ago, I didn't believe in networking that much because I wasn't very good at it. But I learned with Laurie the hard way that that's the way to go. So when I applied to a USA job, I passed the, the whatever you call that, the search, the search, the search. The search. And I have to, I mean, how many is it out of NIA? Like 25. And the only two people that come in for interview was the, the, the institute where I did the detail and someone that I approached at SFN and said, listen, here's my CV. I'm looking for a job. This is who I am. And that person coming for interview, and this is what I am right now. Huh. So 
So the atypical way to get jobs are real. And I, I, I didn't, I was kind of uh, skeptical when, when I heard it here sitting over there, but I, actually it happened. That's, that's the way it works. Yeah, so I mean, each one of you came in through different ways, which I think is kind of fun, right? So Oliver came in directly through the Commission Corps. Rebecca came in through the contracting, which is very normal um, mm -hmm. in federal mm -hmm. service, is yep. the contracting to an FTE. And then at FDA, again, very normal, staff fellow, then transitioning over to an FTE, and then Delaney straight into usajobs.gov. So you guys, I, I love the fact that we all had different, different ways to get, I mean, I'm a federal employee too, so um, we all got different ways to get here. I think one of the biggest questions we often get for government jobs that you guys are not going to be surprised at is international. If you are not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, can you do these jobs? Yes. <laughs> I, I'd love okay, to good. answer that because, you know, I mean, I'm a, uh, so, yeah, whenever. You, go ahead. Go ahead, Delaney. You start. All right. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm technically a, a, a foreign trainee, although I'm not because I became a citizen uh, right when I when I came into NIH. But I went through the whole process and I know how painful it is. And probably in the times that we are living right now, they are even more painful for different reasons. But uh, so unfortunately, it is very hard. I mean, uh, to get a job if you are not at least a resident. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure there are uh, possibilities, uh, especially through the uh, contracting agencies. Mm -hmm. But I, I know for a fact that it's really hard. And my advice is, uh, if you're planning to stay, which is, I mean, if you are here listening to us, you probably are, try to get at least your residency uh, as fast as you can. Uh, there are ways to do it. Uh, the H-1 visas, I know that that NIH is Yeah, hard. that's all complicated, right? Yeah. How but, about Brian? What about at the FDA? Is it possible? Absolutely. So I think there's fellowship opportunities. Like I said, a staff fellow, I, I don't believe it's required you to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, you know, so I, I think that, you know, there's there's visiting staff fellowships as well. So and it's just a question of, of renewing that fellowship. You know, yeah. so there's definitely yeah. options. And it's interesting because that fellowship's not a real fellowship, right? It's just a payment mechanism in most ways. Um, the staff fellow, right? It's uh, Title 42. Well, yeah. So. I mean, I don't want to be put on the spot here, but but, but are. yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, in a way, like from my perspective, it essentially was like a converting mechanism because you know, because oh, they they I had it. My fellowship was renewed, I think, once because I wasn't converted until like my third year. Um, Let me be more specific. It's not like a fellowship, like you apply for and be selected from every. It's more like a posta, like a. A That's senior, correct. senior postdoc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's other fellowships at the FDA, such as the commissioners, correct. where you'd have to apply. But for a staff fellow, there's no like application to a program, so to correct. speak. Yeah. yeah. How about Rebecca? How about you? Any uh, opportunities for international fellows? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Delaney that it's pretty tricky <laughs> to do it. But um, if you have work authorization, I know that contractors will hire. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And Oliver, how about you? So in order to serve the in the US THS, you have to be a US citizen. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are interested in that kind of position, you will have to be a citizen um, in order to do that. All right, guys, um, we're wrapping up here. I have a couple of more questions. And I think one of the biggest ones, I have two, if you could go back and be a trainee all over again, don't panic. Um, uh, what would you do differently in order to make yourself make the transition to your new job be better? Um, who wants? I don't. Who wants to start? I, I can go. Okay. Um, so I think I did a pretty good job of getting outside of the lab experience and writing and leadership, and all that was really helpful. The one thing that would have helped me, I think, additionally, is if I learned to code at least a little bit. We do a lot of data analysis and data crunching. <laughs> Um, and so, like I mentioned, we have data scientists and developers in the, in the office, and it would, it would help um, when managing or coordinating with them if I had some knowledge of either Python or R or any of those. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Who's next? I can go. Uh, so, uh, my advice would be, so when I first, when I first came to NIH, uh, uh, 
it is a little different because when I first came, my my focus was uh, becoming a faculty uh, at a university, right? Mm -hmm. And so that started changing when I start learning uh, the, the all the opportunities that that the government brings and, and the, the, the NIH uh, that provide. So my advice would be. Even if you have like a very clear idea of what you want to do, get ready for, you can call it plan B or alternative pathway, whatever. Get ready as soon as you are at NIH. Because this is the only place that I have been. I've been in five universities before NIH. And so you never get this kind of information, this kind of uh, knowledge of all the positions that. So I, I thought that the only thing I can do in life was doing experiments all day long. And as, actually, it's not true. We are problem solvers, so we're ready mm -hmm. for pretty much whatever is out there. So my recommendation is, as soon as you get up to NIH, get into this kind of uh, symposium, get as inform much information as you want, and start preparing for whatever plan B or whatever alternative career path that you can take. And that's what I would, what I would have changed is start earlier than yeah. I started. So. All right, how about you, Brian? What do you wish you would have done? Yeah, it's a little tricky. Um, I think so. Like what others have said, like I've, you know, did a lot of volunteer teaching experience, like outside the, out, outside the lab, in addition to the lab duties. So, it, you know, and 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 I, I really like tried to find the ways to learn about regulatory review work, but it was kind of hard at that time to to find opportunities. I know mm -hmm. there's professional societies that that you know you can enroll in classes. They're starting, you, know, you know, universities starting to have like master's programs to learn about regulatory affairs. So, I mean, at the time for me, you know, there wasn't many options. You know, I know there there would be a, a career fair as a graduate student. You kind of see it like a side note, you know, regulatory affairs, and not much, yeah. you know, about a pathway. And I always had an interest in it. So, I think I would have like, you know, try to maybe, you know find a way to get more experience besides doing uh, the FAES course, but I can't really regret it just because, you know, I, I made it. So <laughs> right, yeah. that's true. I, I think like my biggest advice for people who are interested in it, and it's difficult because, you know, um, you know, most people, you know, have a PhD, uh, doing a postdoc, um, they're not going to have direct, you know, drug development experience, manufacturing experience, and regulatory review experience. So I think, you know, if, you know, you do the networking, you get your foot in the door and you really have to sell yourself, make yourself translatable, you know, highlight mm -hmm. your experience, you know, um, you know, what you've done in the lab and outside the lab, lab, you know, for example, for biologists and chemists, you know, you utilize, most biologists and chemists utilize methods that are, are commonly used by companies to assess the quality and safety of drugs. So mm -hmm. it's all about recognizing that and selling yourself on that. And there's also other skill sets you really, you know, should really focus on and demonstrate, you know, once you get the opportunity for an interview. Okay. Like writing, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, teamwork, uh, collaborate, multitask, uh, leadership potential, yeah, critical thinking, those things. How about you, Oliver? You're last on our list here. What would you do if you could do it all over again? That's right. I think in order, in addition to what they have talked about, I think one thing important is for all the current postdocs trainees there is to relax, really have, have fun. I think that's very important because looking back, I think the time at NIH is a good time. It's a learning environment, good people there. Don't worry about too much about the future, you know, opportunities, jobs, you know. When I was there, I always worried, when am I going to get a job, you know, as a postdoc? But, uh, you know, Looking back, I think all the people there, the time when I was there, all the postdocs, they landed a good jobs and there was a good career. So just keep learning there. Don't uh, just focus yourself on research. Just look around and see what people are doing and uh, uh, let work and go into the symposium, career symposiums to, you know, network and uh, make them friends there. Just enjoy your time there. Ah, that's really nice. Yeah, I mean, everybody's postdoc buddies have friend, have jobs, right? I mean, people have jobs all over the place. And I think the government's one place you can take a position. I'm so um, anything else you guys want to add before we wrap up for the for the panel? Well, Laurie, so about what I said, because a lot of time I forgot to mention something because a lot of time, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of people that are in the, in the transition. 
And so I want to make sure that that they don't get me wrong with if your main thing is to become a faculty, I'm not trying to say, uh, uh, forget about that idea. You just get, get in your mind that there is, a, there is another alternative if that doesn't work out. So that's, or if that's you change I, your mind, right? Exactly, you, exactly. I mean, you could just decide that this may be what you want to do, and that's perfectly yeah. normal too. All right, anybody I else? A lot of, I was yeah. going to comment to that. I think a lot of these alternative skills are actually really applicable if you do become a faculty member as well. You need leadership training, how to manage people in your lab. It's important to know how to write. You have to write a lot of grants. So I think it's worth doing regardless of what your career is going to be. 100% I agree. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I, don't, I do not regret my postdoc at all, even though I don't. And you guys are all much closer to science than I am, but I still learned a lot in that postdoc mm -hmm. time. All right, you guys, anything else? Last chance? Okay. All right, Oliver, yeah. I know it's kind of, right now, it's the worst time probably for our nation right now. We have to do this at home. But also, I think it's a good time, maybe the best time for Chinese postdocs looking for a job, especially in science, in public health. We need a lot of researchers mm -hmm. for the, to do research, find a cure for the, you know, COVID. Sure, yeah. but all, we also need the workers to do contact tracing, to do public health work, to work in the laboratory, to do testing. I know our commission corps actually is hiring people. Next year will be 1,000 the office news officers that are trying to rec wow. uh, recruit. All the categories are open. So there will be a great opportunities if you are interested in uh, public health work. It's really a good opportunity. Once you are getting the commission corps as a candidate, they do have some opportunities they send it to you. So maybe it will be easier yeah. for you to secure a federal job that way. So I highly encourage you to look into the career in a public health service. Thank you. That's awesome. All right, yep, one more, one more. One more thing. Uh, so I mentioned the detail, which is very important. If, if you are interested in a job like mine, I am aware of a detail right now. So well, get you, my This contact. is gonna be forever. So. Oh, so, I'm, but you know, I mean, and I think I'm one a, of the things I'm also going to put in there, detail is also known as a volunteer opportunity. And if you're at a university and you don't have all this opportunity, you actually do. You have a tech transfer office, you have a grants office, you have someone who's writing the INDs to send off. So go find those offices that are at your university. Um, and at the NIH, if you if you're a trainee at the NIH, come see me and I can um, help with that. All right. Well, I was gonna say that I don't want to have the last word. I really don't. Oh. <laughs> but if you if you want to be successful at your transition, come to Lori's office. Ah. I recommend that hundred mm -hmm. percent. I tell that to everyone I speak with. Yeah. Go talk to Lori. She's always always there. I mean, she'll find the time. And you will come Aww. out of her office like in a much better position. Oh, you guys are sweet. All right, guys, I cannot tell you how nice it is to see all of you and how much I'm, how grateful I am that you shared all your stories. Um, I, this will go up on our YouTube page, so it's going to be awesome. But thank you so much for spending time with us today um, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you.